Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Ruben Sussman of the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, also known as ACEEE. I'm here with Maxine Jacumbo, our communications associate. And so we're physically in Washington, D.C., but our speaker today is out in California. The place where we're physically sitting is ACEEE, and it's a nonprofit research and advocacy organization which works to advance energy efficiency policies, programs, technologies, investments, and behaviors. To learn more about ACEEE, you can check out the website ACEEE.org. I'm the senior manager here of the Behavior and Human Dimensions program, which means that I lead research on human behavior and energy efficiency, as well as co-chairing the annual Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference, also known as BEC. BEC is a unique conference in that it brings together individuals who don't always have the opportunity to share knowledge, researchers, policymakers, utility program implementers, and businesses that are focused on energy and behavior to achieve actionable climate solutions. So BEC's in its 12th year now, and it's convened by ACEEE in collaboration with UC Berkeley, Stanford, uh, UC Berkeley and Stanford University. So since its inception, we've, we've helped spark the creation of companion conferences in Europe and Japan. And this year, we've started a webinar series to present this research throughout the year. Today, we present the third webinar in our series. Beth, can you go to the next slide, please? We would love to see you at this, uh, this year's DEC conference, which is taking place in Sacramento, California from November 17th to 20th. And the early bird registration deadline has been extended. So you can still save $100 by registering now or before June 7th. So that's, uh, I guess you can see, you can all see a picture of me now, so you get a sense of who I am. Uh, before our speakers begin, I'd like to put a few logistics. All attendees are currently in listen-only mode, and following Beth's, um, our lead speaker, Beth Carlin's remarks, we'll open the webinar up to questions. Throughout the presentation, please keep your, uh, type your questions into the chat box. Myself and Maxine here are monitoring the chat box, and we will address those questions during the Q&A period. Similarly, if you're having any technical difficulties, Please just put that into the, the chat box and we will take care of that. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and we'll send a link to the registrants after the webinar. So don't be too concerned if you missed something or if you want to share it with other people, we will make a link available. So now I'd like to introduce the speaker for today, Dr. Beth Carlin. Dr. Carlin is a member of this year's DEC organizing committee, as well as an academic who believes that the role of research is not only to better understand the world, but also to improve it and devote uh, time equally to both of those goals. Like myself, she has a background in social and environmental psychology. Dr. Carlin founded the Sea Change Institute to bring together leading academics and practitioners to work on program strategy, implementation, research, and evaluation of behavior programs for social and environmental change. She also holds academic appointments as a senior fellow at the USC Norman Lear Center, is founding director of the Transformational Media Lab at UC Irvine. She serves as the US expert on the International Energy Agency's DSM Task 24 on behavior change, and, pres and she's president of the American Psychological Association uh, Division 34, uh, Environmental Psychology, or just recently became past president. Today's webinar is on the science of storytelling, how to apply that to climate change communication. Thank you, Beth, for leading today's webinar, and um, Delighted to have you take over from here. All right, thank you, Reuven, and welcome everyone. I know there are a lot of people I know on this webinar, so thank you so much for joining. And those that I don't know yet, nice to meet you. My name is Beth, and I love the BET community. I love the work that I do, and I'm honored to be here presenting as part of our BEC webinar series about a uh, topic that is near and dear to my heart, storytelling. So um, I'm going to, let's see if I can figure out how to click. There we go. I'm going to share three thoughts on storytelling today. I'm going to walk through and give you a little information um, about each one, three kind of key lessons that I've learned from my work from my practice and my research, um, looking at storytelling and the role of media and storytelling in climate change. But first, I want to tell you a story about me and my why. I think that um, that we should always be starting with why. Some of you who have 
who I know have seen me speak before know I love to always start with why I think it's really important that we ground ourselves in why we're doing what we're doing, whether it's telling a story, designing a pamphlet or brochure, flying across the world for a protest or what have you. Um, so I wanna tell you a little bit about my why because this is what I do a lot of. I spend a lot of time these days giving talks and, um, and doing things with PowerPoint, telling stories with PowerPoint, but that's not what my life and my career always look like. My life actually used to look a lot more like this. And I know what you may be thinking, there's no adults in this photo, but you're wrong. There I am. I was in my late 20s. I was working as an outdoor wilderness instructor and high school activities director. And during those years, in my from my early to my mid to late 20s, um, I loved engaging and introducing young people to the natural environment. I spent my early to mid 20s as an outdoor wilderness instructor teaching kids how to rock climb and showing them how to orienteer. And then I came back and took a job in house um, at a school. So I moved from Yellowstone, that picture on the left, back to Venice Beach, where I live now on the right and became a high school activities director, really believed in engaging young people. But somewhere around just over 10 years ago, around 12 or 13 years ago now, I started thinking about the big picture. I was making balloon arches in my day job and reading the New York Times on Sunday, look, looking at this thing that um, a lot of us know as the Keeling Curve, but my friends at the Story of Stuff Project call this the graph of bad things, because really almost everything was going up on the y-axis as time went on. Species extinction, carbon, uh, oh, childhood obesity, you name it, it was getting worse. And I started thinking about where do I fit in? And I love educating young people and exposing people to the beauty of this world. And is that enough? Is that what I, is that the best way for me to maximize and leverage my impact? Like I said, I lived in LA. So I started thinking about media, about stories. At the time, there were lots of movies coming out that we're really getting people to think and talk differently about our relationship with the world around us. And I remember distinctly one summer, and it was the summer right when I decided to go back to school, I, I remember seeing two documentary films about the topic of genocide in Africa within three weeks of each other. They were both like big screening. Actually, one was a really big screening. It had John Prendergast and Don Cheadle, and it was a big hoopla. And, um, and, at, and at one point, the narrator turned and spoke directly to the audience and said, you're watching this. Your heart is breaking. It's the film on the top. You care a lot. And the credits are going to roll. And you're going to go get a Diet Coke. And I remember sitting there thinking, he's right. And it made me me so deeply sad that we could learn about these things and then not take action. And then a couple weeks later, I was invited to this little kind of screening at um, at UCLA. A friend of a friend um, was organizing it. They knew some folks down in San Diego who had made this tiny film. Um, there were no celebrities there at the time. Uh, this was the summer of 2000, either six or seven. And um, and this film, the narrators also spoke directly to the audience. The credits rolled at the end of the film and they said, this war isn't over. We're not gonna stop and neither are you. We're gonna keep going and you're gonna join us. We need your time, talent, and money. And they proceeded to form a movement. And I remember watching that film and thinking, wow, they're right. And I felt so good the second time. And so I started thinking about uh, this idea is, the world really like a Kevin Costner film, not Waterworld. That one's depressing. Field of dreams, right? If you build it, will they come? Storytelling has to matter. We feel it in our bones, but not necessarily. There must be some reason why some films make a difference and some don't. So I started a, a colleague of mine, Emily Varellen, said something that we often see multiple films on similar subjects with a similar social change goal. So I went back to school and I started studying this. I started looking at technology and storytelling. I started studying two things at the same time. One, many of you are very familiar with. I started studying smart grid enable residential energy feedback, right? That's a whole lot of syllables. And then since that's about as 
boring sometimes is watching paint dry. I started studying movies on the side just to keep myself awake when I was pulling all nighters. So I started saying these two things because I thought they were the same. And I thought that information could have an impact if we engage people. Because around that time, Google Power Meter came out and they were just giving these bar graphs. And I thought film could teach us something. Storytelling could teach us something about how to communicate effectively with people about the things that we cared the most about. And the thing I cared the most about and still do is anth anthropogenic climate change. So I started looking, there are lots of films out about these issues. This list was compiled as of six or seven years ago. I think six years ago was the last time we updated it. There's more now, right? But Emily said, went on to say within the range of storytelling, some things speak to audiences and others do little more than entertain or inform. So what we started doing, um, in my lab at UCI and then moving on to the Norman Lear Center at USC and now at the Sea Change Institute is really marry behavioral science theory with empirical methodology so that we could do both evaluation to prove and research to improve the role of storytelling and social change. So that's my why. Now I'm gonna, I want to share, if anyone's not familiar with this, I highly recommend Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, and his work. If you don't like books, that's okay. He gave a great TED talk on it. Um, and I'm going to very briefly talk about the why, the how, and the what um, of storytelling. Not the why, but a couple whys and hows and whats of storytelling. And then I'll get back to my three points, I promise. Um, so why stories, right? There's all these reasons. There's some cool science. I love fMRI data. There's some cool science that shows that, that, storytelling narrative is hardwired into our DNA that our brain fires way more when we hear a story than when we're given um then we're just we're just giving statistical or just generic factual based information people remember things better when it's told in, in a story as opposed to unconnected con facts right and re Research has shown that stories are more interesting, more engaging, things like really uh, nerdy scale results like narrative transportation and spatial presence and empathy increase. They're more interesting, they're more understandable, they're more believable. And importantly, if you're trying to tell a story in order to engage somebody to do something like eat less meat or turn off lights when they leave a room, stories can be more persuasive than other forms of communication. And best of all, we're already doing it. We're storytellers already, right? So we're naturally able to tell stories. So it seems it seems like logical that we could and should be doing more of this in our science communication work. Now I want to talk about the how. There's not one how to stories, but when we think about the how of stories, we can think about story structure. Story structure does not necessarily start with once upon a time and end with the end. There are lots of different story structures. The most famous and the study of story structure goes back thousands of years to Aristotle, right? Aristotle's dramatic art or the three part structure where we see you start to introduce character and you introduce people to a story world, then something, there's a call to action, there's rising action, some sort of crisis emerges, there's a climax point, and then this, and then a resolution moving into one of my favorite words to say, denouement, because it makes me sound fancy, um, that resolution at the end where things are, are potentially better. You can also look at this in a slightly more fun way, right? You're introducing a character in a setting. That character has a goal because the motive and there's a motivation that the audience recognizes. Some inciting incident draws them in into an adventure, some sort of struggle. And there's conflict and problems and risks and a crisis and a peak. And then it resolves. We close all the open ends where we've returned home, we're changed, but the same. This has been adapted in kind of more modern, the modern era by Joseph Campbell. He talks about the hero's journey. And a lot of stories follow the hero's journey, especially in film. If you think about, this is very similar to that arc, but you've got that, that Aristotle's arc, but you have this cross, this threshold into adventure, the journey of trials, some sort of metamorphosis, where the, journey, the, the man or woman becomes, or frog becomes a hero, then they use whatever they've gained, whatever new power to save something and then return. Um, we can think of films like Star Wars um, and a lot of almost, almost any kind of action adventure film that we've seen follows this traditional arc. A lot, a lot of people argue one of the reasons why Game of Thrones was so um, 
impactful was because it actually broke that story. So that means just because this is a classic thousands of years old story, it is not the only story structure you can use. Here's another story structure that I love. And this is, um, this is based on Nancy Duarte's work where she looked at great speeches over time. And she found a secret structure from the Gettysburg Address to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And this is actually coding, right, valence coding of this, of Martin Luther King's speech. And it starts with kind of setting the ground. There's an introduction, and then it goes, and there's a problem. And then it kind of goes up. It goes up and down between what is and what could be. So if you think about Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, I have a dream where children fight, play together. But right now, here's what's going on. Here's what could be, here's what's happening. And then we move into a call to action. Here's what you can do to help us see this future. Here's what it might look like without the coding, right? In the beginning, so you can see these, the similar structure, but much more focused on communicating with an audience, right? We're gonna introduce you, we're gonna call you to action. I'm not the hero, you're the hero. Let's call you to action. And this is really important. It goes up and down between what is and what could be. It varies the emotional intensity. A lot of climate communication does not follow this up and down in terms of varying tone. We watched a lot of, we did some content analysis of, of climate change talks as well as documentaries. And they don't look like this. They tend to look like bummer, 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 bummer you should do something, roll credits. And our, our brains don't respond well to that. We love twists. That's why comedy affects us the way it does. That's why horror affects us the way it does. We wanna go up and down. And then moving into the call to action, if you join me, we'll reach this new bliss. So we can think of a lot of famous talks and another story structure that might make sense, depending on what kind of stories we wanna tell. If this kind of, I was called to action. If the Star Wars model doesn't fit your most recent uh, scientific experiment or, uh, or water quality study, this might be another way to communicate. And a third one I love is Marshall Gans. Marshall Gans um, founded the New Organizing Institute based largely on his work with Cesar Chavez, who he's in the photo with here. And he talks about stories. And this, are, this is how to tell stories in terms of engaging people. This was a story structure that was perfected by the union, uh, by the, the migrant farm workers union in knocking on doors and engaging people to take action. It's been used by many social causes over the years, civil rights, um, gay rights, and so on. And it looks like this. There's three parts of this story, the story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. And what he says is when you're knocking on someone's door, when you're trying to communicate one on one or in a group with somebody, you want to start by talking about you. I'm Beth and I care about the environment. Right. I, I'm Beth and I lived. I worked out in the mountains and I and I decided that I wanted to do something. I'm Beth and I live in Los Angeles. I'm Beth and my family went camping every summer and I just fell in love with the environment and decided I wanna do something about it. Get personal, talk about yourself. Research showed, they, there was some research done on, on organizing for gay rights and they found if the person who was knocking on the door had a close, a personal relative that was gay, that was, they were a more effective communicator. So share your own story. Then the story of us, find common ground. And I know that you agree with me. I know that we all want this world to be better for our children, whatever that is, I'm being very generic. Um, and then the story of now, present that call to action. So you can see there's overlaps between all these story structures. They all have kind of their unique elements, but they all really combine this sense of character, connecting personally, and then draw and then some sort of call to action, some sort of incitation and some sort of connection between the storyteller and the story audience. So these are three ways to think about the how of stories. And then finally, the what. Um, Henry Jenkins talks about story, uh, transmedia or stories as having three primary story elements, which I love to think about um, when I'm crafting a story. And those are story world, story character and story plot. Now this can be interpreted in one way if you're thinking about something like Game of Thrones, right? Strong, strong world, 
um, overwhelming plot sometimes, lots and lots of characters, right? And there's a balance going back and forth between world and plot and character. You can also think of the world, if your communication, if your storytelling is being done in a local community or at a conference, what's the story world that you're entering? What is the environment of the conference? What is the audience like? Who are they? What is this world? You can also create the story world. If you're telling a story about research, about field work you did in Namibia, create the world of Namibia. If you're telling a story about, about the world of research in your lab, create the world of your lab, right? So be aware of the world you're in telling a story and then be aware of the world that you're creating. Um, character, that can be you. That can be others, those that you studied, those that you're trying to help. That can be the audience, right? This kind of idea of the call to action is here's what you can do. And then plot. Plot, again, does not have to be beginning, middle, and end, but where is your arc? How are you following? How are you pulling people along? Even devices as simple as three fun thoughts or why, how, what gives something that could otherwise seem like a very unstructured talk where I'm just throwing lots of information at you, gives it kind of a plot, an organizing structure. What is your plot? Your plot could be introduction, methods, results, discussion. That one works. If you can come up with one that's a little more interesting, feel free. You'll be rewarded in terms of people's attention and their feedback and response. So like I said, I will share back to my three thoughts on storytelling. First, there's always a story. Stories don't just exist in story books. Stories exist in our minds. We think in terms of stories. So if you think about what you want the narrative in your audience's mind to be, you can think more clearly about, you can kind of have a lot of power over what's going on in their minds. So for example, if you look at this picture, And just take a look at it. And I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to think the answer in your head. A few of you might have heard me talk about this before, hopefully not too many. So I'm going to ask a question. In this photo, and a picture is a thousand words, right? There's a story here. Something happened in this picture. Some story took place. And I'm going to ask, did you see the broken headlight? And think to yourself, did you see that broken, did you see the broken headlight? Now, what if instead I asked you, did you see a broken headlight? What research has found is that people are more likely, twice as likely, to have seen a broken headlight in that image if they were asked the question, did you see the broken headlight, than if they had seen a broken headlight. That refers to the idea the paper talks about the replacement of an indefinite with a definite article increase false, increases false memory recall. Why? Because we're telling a different story. When I ask you this, I'm telling you there was a broken headlight. Did you see it? When I'm asking this, I'm saying, I don't know if there was a broken headlight. Similar research looking at things like this have asked how fast were the cars going when they collided versus when they crashed or smashed. Every word contributes to the narrative, to what people hear. So just understand the power of everything. That story is not just once upon a time, it's every single word that can stress you out, but there's a lot of power in that. It means that in everything we're doing, in our home energy reports, in our pamphlets, in our brochures, we're telling stories, right? Those famous O Power reports, comparing your energy use to your neighbors is telling you a story about who you, you are in your community, how you stack up. And for a lot of people, that works better than just saying, here's how much energy you're using. So thinking about where that story is and that there's always a narrative element. So think when you design something, what's the story? What is somebody interpreting? Think of it from their perspective. I sometimes think if someone's reading this, what are they thinking in their head? And if it's not what I want, I need to recraft my narrative. Second, Less is usually more. So this image at the bottom is from, I already mentioned, my friends at the Story of Stuff Project. I love them. I did research with them for about five years during my graduate program, and it was such a great learning experience for me and for them. And I love the story 
of the story of stuff. Annie Leonard, who founded it, was giving these talks. She, much like me, was very concerned about the environment. And she was giving talks about why we need a paradigm shift with our relationship to the material goods economy. And she really felt like we needed a paradigm shift with our relationship to the material goods economy. She was giving talks all over the place about why we need this paradigm shift with our relationship to the material goods economy. And for some reason, people were not vibing on this. She wasn't getting huge audiences. And she thought it was the most important thing that we could be thinking about. This is about, uh, I should know, the year of the first film 15 years ago or so. and she realized that maybe she wasn't telling a clear enough story, even saying why we need a paradigm shift with our relationship to the material goods economy is hard to, to say, let alone explain. So she got a grant from the Tides Foundation and they funded her to work with an organization to that, that focuses on storytelling, founded by a man named Jonah Sachs. And they partnered together and they developed and they took that PowerPoint and they broke it down and simplified it into, and he said, I think, I think you're trying to tell the story of our stuff. And so they designed a film called The Story of Stuff, a 20 minute cartoon. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. There's now about 12 of them, the story of plastics, the story of bottled water, the story of change. Um, but the very first one focused on these five pictures, which tells the story of our stuff. And that transition really made a huge difference. That story then has now been viewed over 40 million times, translated into a bunch of languages. They've become a nonprofit. Like I said, they've made a lot more films. And, and look, there's no counterfactual. I can't say this for sure, but I'm pretty sure, and so is Annie, that why we need a paradigm shift with our relationship to the material goods economy, even as a 20 minute YouTube video, wouldn't have had the impact that the story of stuff did. So what does that mean? So really, um, we need, oh, my transition didn't work there. Um, so, so people say you have about 60 seconds, but really you, you need to convey, you need to get people's attention in eight seconds. You need to convey a hook very quickly so that people will even decide whether they listen to the other 60 seconds. You need to get people in really quickly. How do you do that when you're talking about something like climate change that is so complex. Well, there's a couple things. There's a lot of different things we can do. One, right, you drill down, you look to simplify the language like the story of stuff project, right? Take out jargon. Find, if you're using a 25 cent word, find a five cent word. What is the way to say, what is a simpler way to do that? Richard Feynman said the way he learned anything, he was arguably one of the, the, the best scientists of the 20th century, he's a physicist, and he said the way I learn anything is I read everything I can about it, then I try and in, explain it to a fifth grader. And I explain it to a fifth grader until they understand it. And until I know it well enough to explain to a fifth grader, I haven't learned it. So think about what is the story of stuff to your material goods economy, right? Um, how do you hook people fast? How do you pull them in? What is that What is that, that interesting anecdote or data point or question, inciting question that you can engage people? You can also do that with your energy, with your attitude, with your eye contact. There's ways to pull people in. And those are narrative as well, right? Character matters. Who are you as that character? Character is as much a part of storytelling as plot. So think about who you are and how you're pulling people in. Also, what do they need to know, right? Scientists, a lot of us in this, on this call are scholars or researchers or folks that are highly technical and we value precision. But precision matters on the back end in terms of figuring out solutions. It might not matter in terms of what we want people to do, significance, right? We don't need people to know all the details of climate change in order to get them to act. We need them to understand enough that there is a problem, but not all the, not necessarily all the details. And that is a tough balance to strike. When you need sometimes to convey a lot of information, it's possible, you have to realize it's hard. Um, there was a man named Henry Miller, not the one that dated Anais Nin, a different one, wrote a paper I love to this day in the 1950s called The Magic Number Seven, plus or minus two, in which he found that about seven is the number of data points that we can take in before our brain starts going, no, no, stop, bye, I hate this, go away. When you think about 
zip codes, phone numbers, social security numbers, we've really taken that to heart, right? That seven plus or minus two. So when you think about information, there's a lot of things where we want to give people a lot of information. How do we, how do we make something feel like less? even when it's more. And research subsequent to Miller started looking at this idea of perceptual assistance, right? Pictures connect the dots. Connecting the dots is one way to make links between large data sets, right? So if you think about constellations, it would be, it would be so hard to memorize every star in the solar system if you weren't connecting them into constellations, right? That helps us go, oh, I see that star, Beelzebub, because it's part of this constellation Taurus. So what does that mean for us? Well, we did some research looking at this. I was really interested in this idea. Like I said, specifically in energy use, studying storytelling does not mean just studying movies. That's a fun part of it, but it's not the only thing. We need to understand how people interpret graphs about energy use. So we thought, where's the story? Where's the arc in your energy use? So we did a, an experiment where we showed people either seven days or 30 days, right? A week or a month of energy use. And we found when you went from that seven plus or minus two up to 30, that people's, people's understanding and self-reported understanding and interest in the image went down. So it was a ten, right? It was attenuated. But it's much more common to give people energy use in a month than in a week. That's much more frequent, right? So how do we fix that? Well, what we did was we put dark colored bars. We created that perceptual assistant like constellations. We separated the weekends and the weekdays. And what that did was it pulled up that loss. We lost we recovered the loss in understanding from, from increasing from 7 to 30 when we did that. We actually found that was the most positively rated of all four. It gave a large data set, but it gave it in a way that told a story. I can look at my energy use. So I'm looking at this graph and I see, so my energy use, I kind of have a weekend pattern and a weekday pattern. Now I know something to do about it. There's some more information, but this might give you enough enough that you now want to know about disambiguated use or something else. We found when the data set was small in the seven, those purple bars didn't do much. It's only in those large data, larger data sets that that perceptual assistance really makes a difference. So we can even with big data, try and make it feel like less. And then finally, storytelling is not unidirectional. It's not a one-way street. It shouldn't, it doesn't have to be, and I would argue that it shouldn't be. So while we think about storytelling as me telling a story to you, that broadcast model, we're seeing now in the world, this is changing. And it actually hasn't always been this way. If you think about the history of oral tradition, we told stories to each other and interacted over campfires. We just then kind of went through an era of about a hundred years or a few hundred years with books and then radios and television where where a small number of people could communicate out to large numbers of people. It's how we think about often giving talks, but now communication goes all different directions, right? We can, people are live tweeting television shows and you sometimes see it in the news, right? They put tw uh, tickers underneath with live tweets. We can engage and incorporate our audiences in our storytelling. And Henry Jenkins in, in a recent book, Spreadable Media, a colleague of mine from USC, um, said that this is moving from kind of a model of distribution to circulation. Or as I mentioned before, I like simplifying language. So I like to think about it as showing and sharing. So while we often think about storytelling as showing, as unidirectional, that circulating sharing model of creating a story together, you are a part of this. It's the difference between the you're watching my movie and you're not going to do anything versus the credits rolling and saying we're this story's not over. We're going to keep telling it together and we're going to end this war. And Henry said, and he was again talking very specifically about about broadcast media, I think this relates to us as well, whether you're calling in from an energy utility or a consulting company or a government agency, while we're scared of losing control, the reality is that we've lost control of our messages. And that's a good thing. Engaging people is the 
best way to involve people. And if you're storytelling for a climate change, for a change, for impact, that's good. Don't avoid it, lean into it. So I'm gonna tell one more story about an organization. This is the organization that ended their movie Invisible Children in 2013 in their first, in sorry, 2003, when they made their first film, The Rough Cut, those credits rolled and they said, we're not gonna stop and neither are you. And over the next decade, they made another 12 films and they built up a large mass, a huge supporter base. And then in March of 2012, March 5th, 2012, they released their 12th film it was called Coney 2012 and it got a hundred million views in six days it was at the time the fastest piece of media to ever reach that point it was the fastest arguably message in the history of human communication it was the first time we'd seen something reach one percent of people living on earth in less than a week that was pretty nifty and um and it wasn't short and it wasn't cats this was a 29 minute 59 second film just under 30 that was important to them about genocide it was dark it was hard to watch in parts it also had levity it also had some sweet parts but it was rough and so people started talking about this viral video i was so fortunate that when I had seen them six years earlier, I reached out actually in 2008 when I started my PhD, I met the filmmakers and said, can I follow you around? I wanna learn about you. And they let me do um, in-house ethnography for a few years. And so when this happened and the Gates Foundation came calling saying, what the hell just happened? How did you make a viral video? And they said, we don't know, ask this chick. She's been following us around for a long time. I started looking at Coney and I started looking at it embedded within the culture that it came from. And I found that three interesting things that made this not quite the quote viral sensation that it was sometimes uh, referred to as. One, they leveraged existing networks. So this picture on the right, is a network map of the first 500,000 shares of that Coney 2012 film. The picture on the left um, is they, they would tour films. So everyone was wondering, so we see huge activities, huge nodes in major metropolitan areas like Dayton, Ohio, Noblesville, Indiana, Oklahoma City, right? Um, now, no offense if any of you are calling in from those places, they're not, they're not LA, New York, Chicago, Paris, right? Why are we seeing huge activities in these few cities and because they tour this film came out march 5th 2012 but they had been touring the film from february 15th to march 1st and so or until past that but um so i i called their their tour booking manager talitha baker and i said hey talitha can you send me a list of where they toured of where you toured over the past two weeks and guess where they were they were in Inglewood, they were in Noblesville, and they were in Pittsburgh. They said to people, we're going to release this to the world and you're going to do it with us. You can also see networks in terms of Kristen Bell, who was very good friends, is to this day with the founders and is an influencer that reached a lot of people. Jason Russell, who's the founder, right? So you could see individuals who had built networks as well as communities. This was not viral, like click share. They built over six years over eight years they built a network so when they said share they were ready not only that they told them where and how to share making involvement public think about those i voted stickers right um and there's evidence that i that an i voted button on facebook increased voter turnout that facebook did a study where they randomly assigned people to be able to put an i voted button on their Facebook page and those who had that option were more likely to have voted. They got in a little trouble. Mother Jones yelled at them for that, but it was a great study nonetheless. So Invisible Children, what they did was they identified 20 culture makers and 12 policymakers. And let me tell you, they thought long and hard about who these people were. They, I saw for the better part of five months, there were, there was a wall of photos up on their, in their offices, and they were trying to figure out Who's going to reach the right? Who, who's going to reach the left? The young, the old. They found. They identified Tim Tebow. They identified Mark Zuckerberg, Oprah. They also Bono. They also wanted people that they knew they could get, people who had already been supporters. So they knew a couple dominoes would fall fast, like Oprah had been a supporter for a number of years, and then others that might have been a little bit more of a reach. 
like Rihanna, who they didn't have a strong relationship with before Coney 2012. And they told their supporters like this, share it with your friends and tweet at these people. Tweet at these people. Make your involvement public. Don't just watch this, share it. Share it out loud, big, bright, and with people who are heard. And then finally, this was not just a online movement. They combined, not only did they tour twice a year for 16 weeks, sending groups of three Americans and four Africans in vans around the country to show that film to schools and church groups. But every year in April, they did a large event that took place on the same day all over the country and world. So they combined opportunities to be virtually active with ways for people to be um, active in their communities. And because of that agency, because they made their followers feel like you're this as much as we are. This isn't our story, it's your story. I'm not the hero, Jason said, you are, we are. We saw things like a supporter in 2010, I could get the, that year wrong, um, at one of their events, the Global Night Commute, led a movement to surround Harpo Studios in Chicago. They stayed up and slept there for three days until Oprah finally said, started to listen. And that was the first time of three that Invisible Children was ever on Oprah. And it wasn't the founders. They let people in. So really think about, are you willing to give up that control? Do you care enough about the outcome to share your story and let it be everyone's with you? If you can, you will have, I almost guarantee it, more of an impact than if you hold it close to your heart and try to make it yours. So those are my three thoughts and I wanna share one final one. Um, if you have one kind of, one of my favorite quotes that I think encapsulates why I love storytelling so much as a scholar. I am a data nerd. I love experiments. I like them to be factorial. I love statistics. I Everything in my life goes in a spreadsheet if it can. And I think like Brene Brown says, maybe stories are just data with a soul. So if you're doing work that involves data, dark subjects like climate change, intractable problems like how we're gonna, how we're gonna stem our emissions, Find the soul, find the soul of the story, find your soul, find the soul of your audience, connect them all together and you will have an impact. And with that, I'll take questions. Thanks a lot, Beth. Um, that was a very fascinating and engaging talk and I'm delighted that you could share that with us. Um, we'll now address a few questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, you haven't typed them into the questions box, just click on that box and type in your questions. We got Maxine here uh, to read these questions and then in fact you can maybe do your best to address them. Um, okay, so one question we have here. Um, many organizations are moving to referring or moving from referring from climate change to climate crisis and global heating. What is your opinion of this? I think words matter. Um, I, I can speak, I can definitely speak to the move from global warming to climate change. Uh, I think that was a great move. Um, I don't have any data. I mean, moving from climate change to climate crisis, it seems like it can go two ways. I mean, and, and just some of you might know, most of you might know this, some of you might not. The move from global warming, there was, there's been evidence that shows that when it's, um, when it's cold outside, people, even liberals, people believe less and are concerned less about global warming. There's this like warming idea that's confused people. So I think moving from global warming to climate change has been a very smart move. Um, climate change to climate crisis, I feel like it could go either way because we need to be careful. People feel really kind of deer in headlights, frozen, freaked out. So I think we need to be careful to communicate. There's this theory called protection motivation theory that says that people, take action if their risk perception is high and their coping appraisal is high. So we need to make sure that people are aware that yes, this is a crisis, yes, this is a problem, yes, we're at risk, but not so much so that we feel like there's nothing we can do. So I think that, that probably is a good move. I think we should, pro I think we we might wanna make sure that we're, we're marrying that with a crisis and we can do something. Or is there a term that conveys that 
but doesn't make people feel like it's dire and there's nothing they can do. So I, I, I'm, I'm interested to, to, and if anyone's doing that work and interested in collaborating on it, I would love to be involved or, or see your results. Yeah, Beth, uh, just on, uh, one tiny note about um, the research on that. There's also, uh, at least there was research suggesting that conservatives responded less to global warming than the term climate change, uh, and uh, liberals did not change their perceptions based on the words. So that's another reason why using climate change rather than global warming was good. But that research might, is a few years old now, so maybe a new word is necessary um, because the divide between conservative and liberal is still increasing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really digging on, and it's not big in America, but it's big in the rest of the world. I'm really digging on Extinction Rebellion because Extinction, it, it makes it clear that like something bad is going to happen and we're rebelling, we're doing something. So you kind of have both threat and coping, that we're rebelling against this idea of extinction. Um, like I said, there hasn't been much activity in North America, but I feel like in the rest of the world, that's really picking up. I don't know how people are tracking it to climate change or not. Thanks, Beth. Um, okay, I'll come in question here. There's no inherent connection between storytelling and facts. Um, is there a danger in relying on stories and anecdotes rather than facts as a mode for social change? Um, so I guess I don't, I think that um, you can tell stories about your data. Uh, so I, I don't think that, I think the plural of anecdote is data. And I think you can tell stories about your data as a whole, and then you can hone in. So what I like to do often when I'm presenting on research is present overall findings and then hone in on, on a story to elucidate. I think it's it's important that we marry the two. But I think you can tell, you know, if you think about I'm going to refer back to, to Brene Brown, if anyone's seen her TED Talk. She told the story of her research. She tells the story of herself with, with having all these cards of, of data from thousands of people, but she didn't tell the story of any individual. It wasn't an anecdote of a single, of a single um, respondent. She told the story of 5,000 interviews. You can tell the story of how you investigated something in a way that isn't anecdotal. You can also then give a big data point and then and then tell a story about it. So I could so I could tell you about the research we've done, you know, I could tell you about research looking at um, at analyzing, statistically analyzing that invisible children, you know, that that hundred million, like the the social network analysis and other research we we did looking at how it's shared spread and shared. And I could also tell you an anecdote about how Obama, Barack Obama, when he met the founders because they passed a piece of legislation that was lobbied in November of 2012, they got about tens of thousands of people to lobby for this piece of legislation. And they were invited to be in the Oval Office when he signed it. Um, and he gave them the pen, which is an anecdote, but it, to, it signifies in our country that that is the person most responsible for passing that legislation. And he said when he met the founders, um, actually it was the second time he met them, but when he was talking to them, he said, I heard about that film from Malia, from my daughter. So that's an anecdote that supports the data. And the data we saw was that the people that were sharing and watching this were overwhelmingly between the ages of 13 and 25, including anecdotally Barack Obama's daughter. I think they can marry very well. Um, another question, thanks, Beth. Um, do you have exercises you use to lead groups through the process of creating a story? I do. We've done, actually at, at Beck a few years ago, we've done two different things at Beck. One year we did a pre-conference workshop on this. And then another year, we actually led very briefly, um, Allison Cook, who was the Director of Engagement and Story of Stuff Project, and I had the opening dessert reception on storytelling. And we talked people through, we did, um, we walked people through the, the three elements of, GAN, of the GANS model, which is the story of, of me, we, and us. But yeah, I do, we do a lot, of, a lot of work trying to, I have a workshop on 
your elevator pitch. It's really hard to work someone through their whole PowerPoint. I'm a big fan of, and here's one more fun thing to think about. We spend so much time thinking about the stories in our talks, but if you think about, you give a talk one to four times in a conference, if you're stupid like me and agree to give four talks in a conference, but you introduce yourself dozens, if not hundreds of times, practice that. It's less, it's shorter and you'll use it more. And so I've been doing a lot of workshops on that one. I think it's super fun. Um, and then we do some work. We've done work with, um, we've done workshops with the EPA and Forest Service trying to help uh, improve storytelling strategy and improve storytelling, the stories that are being told, PowerPoint presentations and informal communication strategies with communities and individuals. And contact me if you're interested in that because I love doing it. It is so fun. Um, another question, um, what do you think about leading climate stories with scare tactics? Um, uninhabitable Earth is so popular right now, but there's also data that suggests fear is not the best motivator. Yeah, it's interesting. The research, the literature on fear suggests that it's, it's really good at getting you to act once, and then if you're not if once your brain realizes that you're not in immediate danger, you can tune out the messenger. So it's kind of, fear is kind of, seems like psychologically it's a win the battle, lose the war kind of tactic. Um, this goes back to what I was saying about protection motivation, right? That, that you wanna make sure that threat appraisal is high. That's kind of the theory side, right? That, they're, that people are aware. And that threat appraisal is further broken down into threat severity and threat vulnerability, which is how bad is it? And can it happen to me? Am I vulnerable? And then you need to marry that with coping appraisal, which is also termed behavioral efficacy. And that also has two elements, which is behavioral efficacy and response efficacy. Can I do it? And if I do it, will it matter? And so fear or threat alone typically leads to anxiety, not behavioral response. So if we freak people out, we wanna make sure that we give them the tools to kill the monster. It's not just about, um, it's not just that the negative messaging is always bad or that it's always good, but rather that you need to pair it with a way to do something about that. Yep, yep. And you have to be careful. I mean, if you go, if you go too far, then, then their heads might be in the sand by the time you start talking about solutions. So it's, it's a powerful tool. And with great power, like Spider-Man's uncle said, comes great responsibility. You have to be careful with fear. It's not, yeah, like Ruben said, you, you don't not use it, pair it and be and treat it carefully. We got a number more questions and we have about five more minutes left. Um, okay, uh, next question. Um, how do you convince researchers that in order for people to really care about their work, they need to tell a better story? A lot of times it seems that researchers are afraid of dumbing down their work and and or not including every single detail. So it can be tough to explain to them the importance of storytelling. Yeah, I mean, I do webinars like this. That's one way. One thing I try and do is I try and be a good speaker and I try and I try and present on really rigorous work um, when I'm presenting on my own research in a way that's 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 engaging. So I try and lead by example. I try and do workshops like this and um, and 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 I try and show show the data when I'm talking to people that that this is how people respond to information. There's a there's a science of storytelling, you know that that we can we can look at. Um, and I you know if I know someone really well, then then I'll kind of ask them to look out at their audiences when they're presenting dry information and decide for themselves, you know, if they want precision or if they want significance how much how much your goal is conveying all the complexity and how much of your goal is getting people to listen somebody one of reuben and my mentors um wes schultz said to me early in my career about a paper i wrote that i had put so many findings in and he said people are going to remember no more than three things from this paper maybe one and if you give them seven they pick the one and if you know what you want people to take out of something your paper your talk be very clear about it, because they're not going to remember everything. Advice. Um, uh, next question. Um, you talk about storytelling, but don't use the term arts. 
is that intentional? And if yes, why? And if not intentional, why not use it? Um, no, it's not. I used to, I, I used to give this a talk very similar to this. I used to give it was the art and science of storytelling. Um, so I, I don't, I don't leave the term out. I actually, what's so fascinating when I started studying, uh, when I started doing more qualitative research and, and this kind of ethnography with, with effective storytellers, I found the story of stuff project invisible children. And I thought they were getting things right that everyone else was getting wrong. What I realized was that they didn't know any of the science, but they were doing almost everything that the paper said to do. They, they got Cialdini like better than Cialdini, but they never read Cialdini. So I think that there is, I think a lot about, I'll geek out for a millisecond, and I think about this not just in terms of art and science, but in terms of the Latin roots of those, which are techne and episteme. And episteme is like knowledge in terms of facts and data, and techne is craft. It's that, you know, it's the art, it's the the knowledge, and it, art is a form of knowledge, the knowledge of creating beauty and aesthetic. And then Aristotle talked about a third form, which is phronesis. And he defined phronesis, or we modern, the modern interpretation of phronesis is wisdom, which is the understanding of the balance between episteme and techne. These are not opposing scales. They are a yin and a yang. And phronesis is the wisdom of understanding how to marry them. And I, I try to do that in my work. If I didn't use the terms, um, it, it was not, due to any lack of respect for, for the power of an artistic approach. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we have a hard stop here. Could you go to the next slide? Um, we have a hard stop here at uh, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, but So we still have a number of questions. So what we'll do is we'll send you those questions. And if you like, and you have the time, you can interact individually with those people that sent those questions. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank everybody on the webinar uh, for joining us today for a story of uh, storytelling for climate change. Within the next day, we will send you the link to this recording of today's event with slides. If um, Beth would be so kind as to share those slides with us. Um, be sure to check out the Beck conference and register before June 7th to get the $100 off early bird rate. Uh, search the Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference on Google or go to beckconference.org to find the website and register. And thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.